which programs are, are being the most productive? Sure. Uh, anecdotally, I would report that I don't see a difference in the turnover, but we can do a, a better data scrub and get back to you on that. Right. So, I, I mean, I'm hoping that we can work together. I'd, I'd hate to have another reporting bill on that. So if we could agree that that is information that's important and germane to carrying this conversation further, um, and we could circle back. Myself, and my office and your office could circle back and get those numbers. Absolutely. Without, without a re another reporting bill, that'd be great. We would enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next we have uh, Council Member Rivera. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your testimony. So really quickly, I want to just give you some background. So for about four years, from 2011 to 2015, I sat in a storefront on Avenue B providing housing services. And during that time, uh, again, the storefront, so it was a revolving door of people coming in and asking for housing. And it was the most heartbreaking thing to say that their only option was really the housing lottery at the time, Housing Connect. Um, you know, there were the, you would, back then, you actually in like 2011, you had to check the back of the newspaper for all the opportunities. So that in itself was kind of an exhausting exercise that desperate people had to go through to find assistance. And so with the housing lottery, you know, I gave a number of workshops. They would be on uh, how to take your landlord to court or how to repair your credit or how to even report heat and hot water outages. And I even gave workshops on Housing Connect. So then I would go on to become an HPD ambassador as a part of my organization, Good Old Lower East Side, and shout out to all the advocates in this room that do the work because I know you do a lot with a very little, and organizing is tough, especially organizing tenants associations and people on their block. So I ask, back then, that was 2014, 2015, we were brought in a number of housing organizations to give you recommendations of how to implement a better system. And you're saying that housing 2.0 will be a better system. I wonder what, what has taken so long you know, I was just looking back at Housing Connect when I used to apply in 2014 and 2013. I'm still number like 32,000, 40,000. Now clearly, I don't need that apartment now. I'm blessed and I'm doing okay. But for all the people that don't know how to navigate the system, for all the people that apply out of desperation that actually don't even qualify for those units, are you working on a system that better educates the, the tenant or the applicant? And so I, I, my, I guess my question to you is, where do you see housing 2.0 going? What, what are you doing to strengthen partnerships throughout the city to make sure that this doesn't become this, this void where people's hopes and dreams go and nothing comes to fruition? Sure. Uh, so Housing Connect 2.0 um, is really going to change the way applicants apply for affordable housing. The current Housing Connect certainly um, has been a great tool to streamline applications um, and the, the um, publication process of um, housing lotteries. Like you said, applicants used to have to go through um, various newspapers to identify when housing lotteries were even happening. And so streamlining all those resources into one system has been very important. But the current Housing Connect really took the paper application process and put it online, which had value but was not everything we needed. And, um, and you're right that it has been too long to get to the next system. However, we really feel like this system is going to catch us up to where we need to be and beyond. So regarding that application portion of it, um, the application will really help applicants understand uh, much better um, things like who their household is, what their income is, rather than asking um, applicants to state their income, and the Current Housing Connect breaks down income to help people understand it a little bit better, what's your employment income, what's your self-employment income, et cetera. Um, rather than asking kind of those broad questions, it will be a set of really intuitive questions to get to a very well-honed application. So just for example, uh, rather than saying, what is your employment income, it will say questions like, did you receive a W-2 last year? If you received a W-2, check by, or enter what's in box five or whatever the appropriate box is in the system. 
Um, uh, did your spouse receive a W-2? All very intuitive questions that people can point to a data point that they have. And let me just, because I don't have a lot of time, are you going to be as thorough and extensive for home ownership opportunities? I was really pleased to see when you added the Michelama portion yes. on it, which I, I do hope as a city we continue to expand that program in a new way. But, you know, there aren't a lot of home ownership opportunities for working in moderate and middle income families. Are you going to be at least creating an application that's as extensive? Because even in my own community, when we organized around Essex Crossing in the Sewer Park Urban Renewal Area, there were home ownership opportunities, and then those were actually decreased over time. So we're looking to the city to count on these opportunities. Are you going to include more of those in Housing Connect? Are you looking to it? And, and are you going to be explicit? Because applying for a home is a very, very serious issue. Absolutely. Yes, the home ownership, home ownership application process will be in Housing Connect. And so many more types of housing, including different types of home ownership, will be in um, Housing Connect, particularly um, with the implementation of Local Law 64. And, and just the last question, how many home ownership opportunities are currently in the pipeline? Um, I, I'm sorry, I'll have to get back to you with that number, uh, but we'll, we'll get back to you. Just a little bit of context, about 17% of Housing New York to date has been home ownership. The majority of that has been preservation projects, some, a lot of the mitchell Lama co-ops, things like that. But we uh, last year rolled out what we call our open door program, which is a uh, new construction of co-op and condos. We started the first project last year, and we have a robust pipeline in pre-development, but they haven't started construction yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, Council Member Chin, and then that'll be followed by um, Council Member Williams' opening statement on his bill. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, I wanted to follow up a question in terms of the marketing um, of the lottery. And I know that um, working with the city, HPD, that's been a lot of progress that's been made um, in the last you know couple of decades. Um, and more and more people are learning how to kind of fill out the application, how to find information, but it's still not enough. I mean, the whole um, issue with Housing Connect, you have to have a computer, uh, you have to be able to do it online. So do you keep statistic in terms of how many paper application that you still are receiving versus just online? Absolutely. Um, so. It varies widely from project to project, and um, in every lottery, we do allow paper applications and advertise for those. Um, the uh, currently across the uh, whole spectrum of lotteries, it's about one to two percent of applications per year that we take in by paper, um, but that varies widely from lottery to lottery. Yeah, um, I think that part is that we still have to do more to really help people who are you know, immigrant who don't speak the language, um, seniors who don't know how to use computers, but they are in desperate need of affordable housing. So I think in terms of the marketing, I know some of the projects that we've worked on, a lot of time the developer, even like asking them to market um, with the local ethnic newspaper, they would only do one. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't yeah. even like bother to do a few more. Um, so I think for the city, is to really look at what other way of getting the information out um, to local nonprofits, library, so that everyone have those information and a resident can just go to the library and be able to get the most updated um, housing that's available to apply. Because um, we do that in our office. I think a lot of council office, we're the, the place where people come up and ask if there's information and, uh, and we encourage people to do that. So I think that in terms of broadening the outreach so that that information is more accessible uh, to families, to people who need to look for affordable housing, um, that would be helpful. Thank you, council member. Yes, we so agree. Um, so under the current administration is really the first that um, the HPD marketing has seen public outreach as a part of our work. Um, my team of about 25 staff members um, does um, 
between two and three sessions in communities per week um, with information about housing lotteries. Uh, so last year we did between 110 and 120 ourselves. But even more importantly, we have the Housing Ambassadors Program. The Housing Ambassadors Program started as just four organizations um, in... Uh, well, with the Housing Ambassador Program, if I've talked to the Housing Ambassador, first you have to really provide more resources, because I know during Essex Crossing and on the Lancy, people were lining around the block, all right? And they were getting inundated and because they want to be helpful. But I think looking at that, if we want the nonprofit organization to really help in this process, we have to provide more resources. Um, you know, sure. it's, it's not just uh, all volunteer. I mean, unfortunately, you also have some of the for-profit groups in the community who sort of like charge people, they know how to look up the housing lottery and they charge um, residents to get an application, which should have been free. So we are encouraging a lot of those because we don't have enough support. Um, the final question that I have is on Mitchell Lama. Is, is HPD um, supervising the waiting list? Because I have one incident where I had a constituent who applied for Mitchell Lama. She was so happy she got selected, and then all of a sudden it turned around and they told her, oh, we have to do the internal waiting list first. They never told her from the beginning. So it was like, oh, what's going on with those waiting lists? And is HPD monitoring to make sure that people who are on waiting lists, you know, get the opportunity Hi, uh, so I'm Julie Walpert, um, uh, Assistant Commissioner for the Mitchell-Lama Program. And we do supervise the waiting lists. And um, the person who got the spot on the waiting list on the external will keep her spot or his spot until the, the internal waiting list is, um, is, um, is used up. So, um, so we do make sure that the, the next person gets it, but the way that the Mitchell rules are, are laid out is that internal people get the first preference. The managing agent should have said to the person that the internal people get preference, and I'm sorry that they didn't, but we will make sure that that person doesn't get skipped over, that once okay. the internal list is, is used. So if they have a complaint, they can file directly to HPD? Yes, absolutely. All right, thank you. Thank you, All Chair. Right. I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner, are you, are you going to be uh, assisting with more testimony? If there's more Mitchell Lama questions. So let me just wear you in. Sure. Right hand up. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Great. And that actually counts for your statements before? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, council member Williams on 716. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and my colleagues for holding this hearing, as well as those who are testifying today. The housing lottery is a lifeline for many New Yorkers searching for the ever-decreasing and elusive affordable home. And considering the housing crisis this city is in, it's imperative that we do all that we can to preserve and promote affordable housing. It's time we took stock of how many are in need and reasons how to best approach this issue. This is why I'm proud that we are hearing my bill along with Councilman Reynoso's uh, intro 716, which is a local law to provide an annual report on waiting lists for each Mitchell Lama housing development. The Mitchell Lama program, which was created in 1955, provides a rental and co-op uh, co ops to moderate to middle income families. Mitchell Lama was an effective affordable housing program when it was first implemented. However, over the years, the program has deteriorated and slowly disappearing. The program is plagued with a number of problems, such as a failure to <clears throat> follow waiting list rules, untrained boards, decrepit buildings, and sudden rent increases. Under intro 716, the annual report would have to include from information on the following, the number of unique applicants on the waiting list on the last day of the previous calendar year, the number of waiting list applicants who were not selected for occupancy in the last calendar year, and people who were behind those applicants on the waiting list but were selected for occupancy ahead of them, the number of applicants who were qualified for preferential selection in the mitchell -Lama development in the last year, the total number of complement total number of complaints about the waiting list received within the last calendar year, including but not limited to complaints about the wait list and preference shown to applicants. The average percentage 
rent increase for the development. It's crucial that we continue to fight for families and all New Yorkers to have transparent access to all opportunities for affordable housing like Mitchell Lama. Uh, I do want to say, of course, uh, no housing plan is complete unless we are talking about preservation since we'll never build our way out of the problem. So it's critical that we make sure that we're preserving the affordable units that we have. And it's also critical that people feel there's equity uh, with these uh, units. Uh, last term, uh, this committee had a hearing on Mitchell Lama waiting list. It was, it was uh, pretty contentious to say the least. Um, I don't know that uh, after that hearing much has changed. I still hear uh, some complaints uh, from um, uh, Mitchell Lama uh, tenants and owners. I'm sure the uh, chair may hear the same. So um, I'm hoping this bill will help uh, at least maybe make people feel better about what's going on. I think there's a lot of questions about the systems in general, uh, whether it's the, the lottery system or the Mitchell Lama housing is the number one question I get, and probably the same as my colleagues. And so hopefully uh, the administration will support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Traeger. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Pornigy. Um So I'll just get right to it as far as uh, my legislation, intro 0564. I reviewed uh, the opening statement. I did not see any commentary about the legislation. Uh, what is the administration's position on my bill? So um, we uh, already do certain public reporting on lottery and are certainly willing to work with you to um, look at what else we should be reporting on. There are, um, when you look at the matrix of really what we would be reporting on under the current bill, there are certain things that get so um, specific that it may um, compromise um, personally identifiable information in some circumstances. And so um, we, we want to be sure that that is never the case. Um, also, uh, the new Housing Connect, I want to say, it will um, help us to accomplish some of the reporting that is currently proposed in a much more efficient manner. And so um, some of the reporting that is requested now um, would be um, really prohibitive under the current version of Housing Connect. Um, but uh, to work with you on what should be reported and then make sure we're um, developing that in the new Housing Connect, we're um, happy to do. Right. Um, so we're not asking for names. We're not asking for addresses. We're not asking for any of that type of... We're asking, you know, it's basic demographic information. It's commonality because, to be very blunt, I think my colleagues and I hear more from those who are being rejected for unclear reasons and purposes rather than those who are winning the lotteries. And we'd like to know from a policy standpoint uh, what's working, what's not working, how do we... Uh, fix and address this process, and and to finally answer the question, affordable for who? Mm -hmm. Affordable uh, for who? And I think that uh, the information that we were very careful to make sure that we don't compromise anyone's privacy or safety, and, and we I fully appreciate and respect that. But this is just basically going by, you know, applicants who are extremely low income, very low income, because we always hear that people are being turned away or rejected based on very small technicalities or things that they could have learned during the beginning of the process. Um, you know, for example, recently I went through a housing workshop in my district where I asked the question point blank, can your credit score potentially uh, knock your application out? And there was an unclear answer because they said, well, technically it can't be the single reason why it can be knocked out, but it could, could, it's, it could still be a reason. Some folks so left the meeting very confused. credit score is not a reason you can be knocked out of lottery. Right, but they left this gray area that some people were still confused about. And so I, I, I just kind of... I think we, we need some more information in order to make better policy decisions uh, and adjustments moving forward. And I would be very much willing to work, work with HPD uh, to, to really make this process as transparent as possible and to report on who's winning sure. and, and why are they winning and why, are, why aren't more folks winning? That's, I think, basic questions that we should be able to answer uh, in, in our government. Sure. Um, uh, transparency is um, a real key um, uh, priority for us, um, transparency both in process and uh, in qualification standards. It is one of the things that we have worked on and incorporated into our guidelines um, under the current administration. We re-released, uh, we, we 
first introduced um, restrictions on developers' ability to reject for credit-related criteria in 2015. In 2016, we incorporated those and codified those into the guidelines. And uh, just last year, in July of 2018, we rolled back those standards even further. And we have really tried to educate applicants around those criteria, as well as just what to expect in the application process. Um, and we'll, we're always happy to take feedback on um, where applicants are still getting tripped up or where there is um, a lack of clarity around that. So we'll certainly be happy to work with you on that. Um, also, uh, surrounding the data reporting, we do, um, on, through open data, um, report on information by AMI already. Um, and again, um, just with regard to um, privacy information, um, when you, uh, again, kind of looking at the matrix of all of the um, reporting types that are in the bill, uh, you know, working with our statisticians at HPD and everything, um, they did raise concern that um, when you get down to the level of um, this AMI in this neighborhood um, and this uh, demographic, um, that uh, you could potentially identify somebody who has received housing. Um, but again, we're more than happy to work with you on that and um, to kind of like walk through some of those concerns. Right, and, and just in closing, I think the chair, just a few more seconds. Uh, if the average AMI of a neighborhood is 40%, for example, I don't think reporting on which AMI levels are winning or not winning is going to give that away because that's already the average. We're not giving, I think, I don't think anything in the, but again, I'll be willing to work with you and I'm very happy to sit down to work this out. We just want to make sure that if the average neighbor, if the average AMI in the neighborhood is 40% of AMI, but people who are winning the application process are 80, 90, 100% AMI, there's a problem because then it's not affordable for those who live there. And that's one of the reasons why we need to really address this issue. But I'd be happy to sit down with you. I want to make sure that we protect pe people's privacy. But I also want to make sure that affordable housing is for those who need it the most in our neighborhoods. That is a, that's the purpose of the bill. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair, for your time. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Levine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're routinely getting 1,000 more applicants per available apartment. There are New York, City lo New York State lottery scratch-off games with better odds than that. Uh, it's so important that this process is run in a way that is fair to the people who are applying because uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that people's hopes and dreams are invested in these lotteries. Um, their ability to continue living in the city may be dependent on winning this lottery. And um, we don't want to unnecessarily dash anyone's hopes. Um, these lotteries are run by uh, private agents essentially that, if I'm not mistaken, submit res reports to HPD on a bi-weekly basis about the, the um, carrying, uh, about the uh, performance of the lottery. And um, it, it seems to me that there is minimal follow-up done uh, based on the results of these reports, but perhaps you can elaborate on the ways in which you can identify errors, um, how you react if you see an unusual number of errors, uh, and the extent to which you're proactively uh, auditing or enforcing in this process. Sure, thank you. Um, so during the um, tenant selection period, so after the lottery is run, the list is, has been randomized and the developer is going through the application period, the application process um, with applicants, HPD is overseeing, like you said, um, at minimum on a biweekly basis. So the developer is required to submit the lottery log to HPD at least every two weeks, but also every time they identify an applicant who they uh, deem to be eligible, they need to submit that entire file, so exactly um, what they have reviewed to deem them eligible. HPD does an independent review of that. Um, and also, um, takes in the lottery log to make sure that every applicant above that um, ha has been processed correctly. Um, and at, at that time, we may request additional documentation, so a file of somebody who has been rejected. Um, and uh, another kind of key point at which we can identify are people being properly 
um, processed is that we do um, have an appeals process as well as an open hotline. Um, and so um, in the appeals process, HPD over the past few years has really taken um, steps to clarify uh, an applicant's point of recourse at every point that they may receive an ineligibility notification. And so um, uh, we end up receiving many more complaints and appeals than we used to just by virtue of transparency of the process. And just to jump in, can you quantify the number of appeals and the, the frequency with which they're validated? Um, sure. So I, I don't have that information at, in front of me. And I will say that um, what uh, what we take in, in it as an appeal now, we take in with a little bit more flexibility than we used to, um, and so uh, the reporting on that is a little bit difficult. But we can we can get you general numbers for sure. Um, and uh, and so that is another opportunity for us to see uh, is there is there something that the developer is potentially doing wrong um, in their communication with applicants or, or how they're screening applicants. Um, we also do, uh, particularly in cases where we think that there may be something going wrong, on-site compliance reviews. So we will go out and make sure that every, um, every file has been processed uh, properly, that every um, type of communication that has gone out is the standard communication. Another thing that we have done over the past few years is standardize all communication that goes to the applicant um, so that the developer isn't giving too little information for somebody to understand why they were really found to be ineligible. Um, and and so just because my time is running out, do, do you ever disqualify or, or sanction in any way uh, an agent due to frequency of errors or other performance problems? Sure. So the primary thing we do, where, where we are seeing errors, the primary thing we want is to make sure that everybody um, who has been misprocessed in some way, that that is remedied. Um, and so uh, we oversee, and typically the lottery is stopped from moving forward, that if there has been errors, that every single one of those is corrected on an applicant by applicant basis. The primary thing that does in delaying the lottery is that it delays um, the lease up of the building, which has its own financial consequence, but also um, usually delays the permanent conversion of the loan so that the construction loan interest goes on longer, which is a real financial penalty to developments. Right. Uh, last question I'd like is to ask whether you account for assets versus income. Uh, there can be people who are asset rich and income poor, um, and that's not really the intended target for affordable housing. How are you distinguishing those two kinds of wealth? Yeah, absolutely agreed. Um, so in, uh, I believe it was 2016, we first introduced um, an asset limit as part of our continuing need criteria. And, um, and so what it essentially boils down to is that a household can have no more than about a year's worth of income um, in non-retirement assets. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Thank you. Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to ask a, a couple of questions, just some scenario questions so you could help me through it. Uh, I get it in my office. I get these questions in my office all the time, and I just feel uncomfortable about, how, about having to answer them and whether or not I have the right uh, answers. Uh, we had a firefighter who made uh, $43,000 a year um, over time. I think went up to like $48,000, $49,000 a year. So, um, he applied. He has a newborn baby and his wife applied for a two-bedroom work, got the notice, came in, they saw his overtime and he was disqualified, even though his base salary was appropriate for the income that they were asking. Uh, he comes to my office asking for help. Sit, he's a city firefighter. I do everything I can in my power to try to be helpful, and I'm told no by the HPD. Mm -hmm. They do not qualify because of the overtime. Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a true situation? I guess it is true because HPD told me it's true, but I, I want you to explain that to a common New Yorker. Um, this person could have easily said, you know what, I'm not gonna take overtime so that I can get this apartment and, make, and take that risk of not having to pay, maybe sufficient pay to take care of his child in an effort to get an affordable housing apartment that would eventually, I guess, compensate for the fact that he get, he's making less money because now he has a more affordable housing apartment. Those are the scenarios I think that we're putting some of our people, uh, some of our residents in. Can you just explain the logic behind the, these insignificant increases in pay through overtime or bonuses that are attributed to a denial of an application? 
Sure. So first, I will say that the standards that we rely on for income calculations are federal standards. They are absolutely required where there are tax credits or any sort of fe federal funding in a project uh, or to a unit. Um, we use those same standards, though, across all of our lotteries so that, number one, people aren't being qual qualified by different standards for different units. Sometimes we have uh, tax credit units and affordable non-tax credit units in the same um, project. It would be very confusing and also really unfair um, to be qualifying people by two different sets of standards. Uh, federal requirements do um, require that we count overtime as part of income. However, um, income, we really look at what is, uh, the, what is the total income over the last year and what is expected over the next year. That expected over the next year is really um, the key priority. So okay, so, and I'm sorry, I have, because of time, I'm going to be, uh, I'm sorry if I'm rude occasionally and cutting you off. Uh, then I have another case where a person worked in a company for six years, never received the bonus, received the bonus, I believe, two years ago, applied for an application now, so this year didn't receive a bonus. That bonus was attributed to their general income. Um, so they, let's say it was 50,000, they got 55,000. Mm -hmm. Now they're over the, they were also over the limit. So I want to so explain that last part that you just were talking about. Um, they lost their opportunity to apply because their income was more in line with 55 than 50 or something like that. Um, and that was a year before. They've been in this same company for six years, never received a bonus, one bonus, and now they're knocked out of the uh, lottery op opportunities. Um, so I would need to look at the specific uh, case. Um, typically, the most recent year is what is weighed most heavily, but we are required to look at least two years back in terms of history. Federal, Federal requirements to look at least three years. Uh, it, it's typically two, depending two. on the type of employment income or um, if, uh, if there has been a, a lot of inconsistency in income, we may look as far back as three, but typically the requirement is two. Okay. Um, I wanna, I'm going to have a conversation with the chair and with the council about that. Um, if it's two, it should be two, and we should have a, a, a very clear conversation about that. We don't want to dismiss people. The amount of applications that are getting denied in my district are overwhelming when people initially think that they're going to be accepted. Um, so they lose faith and they don't want to apply anymore, and I don't want that to be the case. Um, applications. You, first, you talk about the ambassador's program. I just want to be clear on the record. The ambassador's program is a volunteer program. You do not provide resources to ambassadors to do that work. We provide um, grants um, to organizations who apply for them um, for some of the work, but uh, you're right that for the most part that is a volunteer. Okay, we just don't want to rely on volunteer programs to be doing pre-marketing work and helping folks with applications and so forth. So I don't want to rely on an ambassador's program unless it's in-house and it's 100% funded by HPD. Um, the applications, they can't be printed online. So in my office, if I want to have an application and take it to Doña Conchita, who lives across the street, she can't come to my office, I can't hit print. I have to write a letter for her, send you a, a, a letter saying that we want the application and then the application has to come in and then we help her apply. Why not just allow me to hit print and allow for her to, so then I can take it to her and help her apply? Sure. So applications, uh, there is a lot uh, that is helpful to an applicant by applying through Housing Connect. Um, so uh, for one thing, an applicant can see what number that, what lottery number they receive, but also paper applications tend to come in with many more errors. Um, there are uh, just data integrity checks through Housing Connect that are really helpful. So as people ask for paper applications, we try to refer them to a housing ambassador who can help them to apply online. Right, but I'm just sorry. But you send them an app a paper application. We do send paper applications. Why can't, as a, as a city agency that wants to partner with HPD, why not allow at least maybe council members with a, a passcode of some sort to print an application so I can do it? I trust my staff's ability to fill out these applications correctly. Why not allow me to hit print? Sure, absolutely. Um, that is something we'd certainly, certainly will be willing to consider. Um, it is very helpful when um, the, the, those who are passing out applications can sit down and help somebody with them. We have trained a couple of council members' offices, uh, Council Member Chin, um, is one of them on um, essentially being a housing ambassador. We would be happy to do that with you as well. All right, thank you, Chair, for the time. Thank you. Thank you. I just can't 
over uh, emphasize what Councilmember Reynoso is talking about. We actually have hardworking, lower middle class individuals who are making choices to underachieve so that they can receive affordable housing. What do I need to do as the chair of this committee to see to it that that's not the case in partnership with HPD? I think that that's a ridiculous proposition that we continue to see in, our, in all of our offices, that people are trying, people are not taking bonuses, not taking overtime, working less. That's a, a ridiculous proposition and it's a recipe for underachievement um, there's got to be a better way to do this. What is your suggestion to me as the chair of this committee in conjunction with HP and HPD? What can we do? I think the most important thing that we can do, council member, is to make sure that we are targeting units at every uh, level across that, that spectrum of incomes, right? So um, historically, we have done an awful lot right at the 60% of AMI mark because that's where the federal resources have come in. What we have tried to do over the last few years and where I think we are headed even more so going forward and we'd like to continue to work with you on this is to make sure that we are building um, the 30%, the 40% AMI units, also the 70% AMI units, the 80% AMI units. 70% um, frankly has been a level that we have done very little to hit because it's hard to mesh with the different funding sources that we have available to us, but I think we have some new ideas that we can do more of that going forward. So just for some context in my district alone, between firefighters, police officers, bus drivers, those are the folks that I'm losing in mass from my district and districts like mine who are contributors to, uh, the, to taxes, who are patronizers of small businesses. Um, it's really a travesty and what we're gonna ultimately see is literally a tale of two cities. I'm in a tale of two districts right now because I can't assist uh, a nurse and a teacher, you know, a, a police off, a firefighter and uh, a school crossing guard there's no opportunities for them, so we've got to do better. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Cornegie, and um, I would like to attach my uh, name to your comments and to Councilmember Reynoso's. We're, we're certainly, we have faced the exact same issues um, on a number of fronts. Uh, and, and one idea, too, might be to, um, you know, work on training of, of your staff, um, just so that they're giving very good, very clear information. That's something, that's a hiccup that we run into on a regular basis, where, you know, things aren't, so the accurate information is not given in the first place, and that, uh, you know, and I can imagine the workers there are just flooded with all these applications, uh, so I empathize, uh, but May I, I ask think whether you um, feel that the, ac the misinformation is being given in things like public seminars or whether it is through feedback to applicants feedback as they to call with questions? Who have put in ap applications and not given good reasons for what's really going on. And if they're given good reasons, we can then go back and think about it. I'm just saying, please put a pin on that. I'm attaching my name with their comments. It's it's not limited to their offices, it's in everyone's office. Um, I really wanted to talk about, asking you a few questions on my bill 357. Um, and, the, and I, again, appreciate Chair Cornegie including this bill in this hearing. Um, you know, the genesis of this bill was from hearings we had a year or two ago about wage loss and wage theft and uh, the concern that uh, contractors that HPD was hiring for its own projects were w some of those firms themselves were implicated in wage theft. Um, so we're trying to get at dealing with that issue. How do we, how does the government fund a project and then hire a contractor who uh, you know, has a history of, of not paying their workers. That was the genesis of the bill, and I'm certainly, if you have other suggestions for how we write it and where we go with the bill, I'm, I'm eager to hear your comments. Um, in your testimony, you, you seem to dismiss it um, pretty, you, you seem to dismiss the idea 
um, due to the concern of unintended consequences on um, contractors not listed as preferred providers. I mean, I think in this, you know, this, this is one where I think we can work together to identify what footnotes are required to define a preferred uh, contractor, um, where we could, you know, think together on why we're doing this. I, I tried to structure the bill in the positive, who are preferred contractors, because you, HPD was very clear that it could not list the, that the disbarment is not something that you, you do. So what I'm trying to get at is where do we publicly uh, give out the information of history of wage theft, uh, you know, history of sexual harassment on the job. How, how do we get that information out and, and really be able to hold the administration's feet to the fire to say, are you hiring the firms that have a good record because then uh, we know the city is, you know, giving positive feedback by, with its putting its money where its mouth is. So let me start by apologizing if I came across as dismissive. That was certainly not at all the intent, and we, we take very seriously the conditions on our projects. Um, I think as our, our read of the bill looked at a much broader array of, of conditions, wage theft, but also other kinds of safety and other issues. So let me just start by walking through a little bit about what we do, and I'm going to ask my colleague to jump in as well. Um, we the, Making sure that we have good contractors on HPD finance jobs is very important to us. And, and I do want to just clarify that the contractors are hired by the developers. So we're certainly involved in the process. But so we just to be clear, to be clear I mean, please, uh, you're still responsible. You're ultimately Abs responsible. Absolutely. I just full want to stop. Make sure, absolutely. I just wanted to make sure that we were, were using. No, vocabulary full stop. The same this way. is city dollars. I don't care whether or not it goes through a third party or not. It's okay. not relevant. Okay. So from the... In my mind, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, from the very beginning, we are looking closely at who is on the job and how the project's being designed and scoped. So uh, the technical team within HPD development is reviewing plans and, and scope design to make sure that it is compliant with all the relevant codes and, and requirements. Sure. Beyond building codes, accessibility, a whole environmental, a whole slew of other things. Before we start the project, we are doing an integrity review. So we're looking at um, do they have violations on their properties? Do they have municipal arrears? Do they, ha do they have any uh, court findings? What's the history of labor violations? So there, there is an integrity review process there as well. Um, and then we are out on construction sites at least once or twice a week for every single project. And certainly if there is anything that's identified, um, we are out there much more frequently. We also have um, what we refer to as our enhanced review process, which is um, uh, looks at both the labor issues and at construction quality. And I'm going to ask Assistant Commissioner Holm to talk through that. Thank you. Thank you. With the chair's permission. Sure. Thank you. So, Councilmember Rosenthal, we do take um, issues of wage theft very, very seriously on our project. And as Commissioner um, Park alluded to, we do an integrity review. Um, and to the extent that we identify contractors that have those issues, we attempt to um, take very proactive measures. Our hands are tied. We do not have the legal authority to debar, as you said. So our concerns with intro 357 is by creating a preferred contractors list that in some ways says that folks are ineligible to participate, not explicitly saying debarment, but saying that only those on a preferred contractors list are those that are eligible to be considered. So throughout. Why is it saying that? I mean, definitionally, all, perhaps then another way to say if the word preferred is not, raises baggage that's problematic, why don't we do a scorecard? Why don't we just say here are the firms in the last year, we have a scorecard. Have there been incidences of wage theft? Have there been incidences of sexual harassment? Have, you know, what is the job hiring history? Then just have a scorecard and just be honest about 
what we know. I mean, of course, integrity is good. So how about a list that meets integrity requirements? And I, go ahead, sorry. So I, I just I want to say one of, the, one of the challenges for us on the wage theft issue is usually what, what happens is that if those issues are happening, workers wait until the project has ended before they come forward. And the reason why is that they don't want to jeopardize the day-to-day -day income that they may have at the time. Sure. And so, so let's say at the end they come for your next project. And so for the next project, what we would do is apply enhanced review. And so for every single project after we've identified that a contractor has engaged in wage theft, we would review whether or not that contractor should be allowed to participate. And our enhanced review list is a public list. Yeah. With all due respect to the committee chair, I'm going to turn it back and cede my time and appreciate your giving me this time. Perhaps we can follow up offline. Um, uh, absolutely. I think that this is, you know, as a former chair of small business, this is uh, an issue that uh, uh, I'm concerned about. So um, on you. behalf of Councilmember Rosenthal as the committee chair, I will be following up uh, with HPD. Thank you. Uh, we have now have Councilmember Salamanca and then Councilmember Williams, and then we're going to go directly to uh, public questions. All right. Um, commissioners, I have some questions regarding Section 8. Section 8 vouchers. Um, is there a hold currently on giving out new Section 8 vouchers? Uh, right now, no, there is not. Um, I, I, I assume, maybe I shouldn't assume that you're talking about in the context of the federal shutdown. Um, no, okay. I'm not referring to a federal okay. shutdown. I'm just, um, we get inundated with a lot of calls from constituents about going about applying for Section 8 vouchers, and there is a, a rumor, or they are told that there is, Section 8 vouchers are on hold right now. They're not giving them new Section 8 vouchers. So, want so to verify that. There are uh, two public housing authorities that are part of New York City government. There's, there's NYCHA and there's HPD. Um, both agencies have Section 8 programs. Um, I believe, although I will defer to my colleagues at NYCHA, that the wait list for their Section 8 program is closed. Uh, HPD uses Section 8 vouchers in, in the context of particular development programs and particular HPD priorities. Um, so for example, when we are doing a preservation project where the rents are so low that they cannot sustain the project operations, we will bring Section 8, we will allow everybody in that project to apply for Section 8 so that we can get more uh, revenue into that project so that we can have a strong, viable community asset going forward, but that we're not negatively affecting any of the tenants in those buildings. Um, another place where HPD uses Section 8 um, on a fairly regular basis is in our senior programs because seniors typically have very low and fixed incomes. We put make um, just about all of our senior housing project-based Section 8. Let, let me be. Let me see if I can clear. So there hasn't been from the federal government uh, a restriction, cutback, rollback or anything on federal Section 8 dollars? Is that, is the, is, because I think that's, that's what my constituents are reporting, that they're applying for Section 8 and being told that the Section 8 program in some way, shape, or form uh, is either being condensed, um, is either the monies have run out. I don't know how it's being articulated to them. I'm asking, is there any, uh, outside of the recent government shutdown, is there a mandate handed down from the federal government saying that that, federal, that Section 8 program um, is being condensed or? or um, no, Section 8 financing is not nearly as robust as we would like it to be. When I started my career in affordable housing, the budget conversation every year was how many new Section 8 vouchers we would get, and these days it's can we hang on to what we have, um, but we have done relatively well over the last couple of rounds of, of federal funding and maintaining the budget for Section 8. Um, it's something we always monitor, keep a really close eye on because it's such a critical program. Um, I think if the shutdown does continue, it's something I'm anxious about. What, what is, do, you, do you know what the waiting list is, the Section 8 waiting list? Uh, I can't speak for NYCHA on their, their Section 8 wait list, and it's, we, rather than have a general purpose waiting list, align it with our, the programs, as I mentioned. So we don't have a general purpose waiting list. Do you, do you know how many years that goes back? HPD's policy uh, yes. or NYCHA's? 
HPD is obviously. Uh, um, w that has been our policy for decades that we align our Section 8 program with the other initiatives that we have going on so that we don't have a general open wait list. So but do, do you know the number combined of those programs? And is there, is there a way as a chair I could get that? Uh, sorry if I'm not following the question. There are about uh, 35,000 people on HPD's program now. Those are people who are receiving rent subsidies through HPD, mm -hmm. and we can certainly, that's my off the top of my head number, we can get you the exact number. We don't have a wait list because we align the program. As vouchers become available, we use it to align with our other existing programs, put it out through a project-based wait uh, RFP, or align it for the, the preservation projects, as I mentioned. So I, I definitely will come back. Okay, I think absolutely. That there's, a, there's some uh, intricacies in there that I, I need to get it, to. Intricacy is a good word for Section 8. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, and Commissioner. Then lastly, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Please, please, please. Yeah. Um, so, if I get a constituent that comes in and uh, they're they're not applying for NYCHA, they're looking for a home, they need help, um, then they're interested in applying for a Section 8 voucher so that they can go and find their own apartment. Is that where can I send them? Does that still exist, or is there a wait list? Or is there kind of a moratorium where you're not giving out those type of Section 8 vouchers? HPD has, has never given out Section 8 vouchers in that way. That's, that's how NYCHA has administered their program. Okay. Um, going back to the uh, homeless set-aside questions, how are homeless families placed in these homeless set-aside units that have been built? How do you work with DHS? How do you select these families? How does it work? So um, for homeless set-aside units and general purpose projects, uh, as units become available or as uh, uh, construction is close to complete, we provide DSS with the unit information um, of, the, of those units and projects becoming available. So um, it, you will give them the AMI levels, the, um, the uh, number of bedrooms in each, um, so they have the specifics to work with um, to help to match clients or submit the right applications to us. Um, generally, they give us more applications than the um, number of units because certain people will drop out of the process. Um, but uh, as I explained earlier, they're doing a general um, data match um, in, as well as conversations with shelters to identify um, families who are um, well-suited referrals and are interested in the particular housing opportunity based on location, for instance. Um, those uh, applications come into HPD. We convey them to the developer so that we can see oversee every point of the um, the review process, uh, ensure that only applicants from that pool are being selected, oversee um, that developers are um, accepting and rejection, rejecting applicants um, in accordance with the marketing guidelines. The marketing guidelines apply to homeless units as well. Um, and as I said before, um, we provide assistance to developers through that process. We help with scheduling uh, the eligibility appointments, et cetera. And DSS is providing um, assistance to the applicant in getting their paperwork together to ensure that they're, uh, they're um, ready for their interview, et cetera. All right. Um, then I guess my time is running out. My last question would be, how many preservation term sheets require a homeless set aside? Uh, the vast majority of them at this point, there are two that do not. It is the, the housing repair program, which is doing very light touch um, rehabs, you know, financing built boiler repairs and things like that. And then uh, the green housing preservation program, which is, again, relatively small scale loans for in, uh, energy efficiency work. You have a number of how many homeless families you've placed in the preservation term sheet uh, project? Not specifically broken down by the preservation, but we can we can look and see if we can pull that and get back to you. Um, I will I will say that the putting homeless set-asides in preservation is is a, a long-term investment in housing for homeless households, right? Um, for the most part, the preservation projects are largely occupied and we fill these at turnover. Um, but had we been doing this a decade ago or 15 years ago, we would be in a different place than we are now. So I think it's an important <laughs> commitment to be making. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you. Um, and as we, this, this will be the last question from council members. Um, and as we transition to the general public's testimony, uh, my predecessor, uh, council member Williams gets to set the tone for asking clear and concise questions. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, for the Section 8 piece, I did want to just make clear, if you're aware of individual Section 8 vouchers, if they're still being issued by the federal government, uh, that's one question. And I also understand that one of the issues with those vouchers, the people who have them, they can't find affordable housing to use those vouchers for. So I just wanted to make that, uh, put that on the record. Uh, yeah, so the vouchers are issued by the Public Housing Authority, right, either in New York City, either NYCHA or HPD, and um, yes, we are, we HPD are still issuing. I haven't the, heard anything otherwise for NYCHA, but I don't want to speak for them. Um, the, but I'm saying the federal government is still giving additional housing vouchers to give out to individuals. Federal, the federal government gives each public housing agency a, both a budget and a voucher authority. Um, the voucher, the, I think the number of vouchers has barely gone up over the last few years and where it has been, it's been in some very specific um, populations. There's been some family reunification vouchers, some veterans vouchers, things like that. Um, budget authority has gone up uh, marginally um, and then the actual tying of budget and vouchers together happens at the local level. So primarily it's been staying the same, maintaining what you already have. Yeah. That's, so there's no, probably no new vouchers is what we're, 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 we're not, that's what we've been trying to get at with all these questions. Okay, apologies all for right. not understanding. The vouchers that we have been issuing are turnover vouchers. Thank you. Um, who's responsible for maintaining and keeping the waiting list records for Mitchell Lama developments and all those records stored in digital format? And I'll just ask my next question. What is the average length of time a person spends on Mitchell Lama waiting list? Hi, council members. Hello. Um, so in terms of maintaining the waiting list, the housing companies maintain the waiting list along with a copy at HPD. Um, the amount of time that a person can stay on a waiting list actually varies. Um, years ago, when, um, when we conducted lotteries, we didn't do limited lotteries. So um, I had some developments where the lotteries were conducted where it could be 10 or 15 years long. Um, and we're still actually going through those waiting lists. Like, even though they're, they're old, people are um, still interested. Um, where much more recently when we do lotteries, we do lotteries um, that we try to um, have three to five year um, lists. And you know, depending on the neighborhood, um, they can be shorter or longer lotteries. We've, we converted to, um, how, to Mitchellama Connect online in 2016, and generally our waiting list, um, we, we try to limit to about 500 applicants. The waiting list is in digital form so, on Housing Connect? So the Mitchellama Connect waiting list that we've conducted since 2016 are, are um, digital, the, the, um, just but only those going forward. When we con convert to Housing Connect 2.0, those waiting lists will be converted to, uh, and will be digitized. So all of the waiting lists from the time we had Housing Connect are digitized. All of the waiting lists from before that are not. Correct. Um, um, how many applicants who qualify for a preference for Mitchell Lama development are offered housing in a development? So um, the preference category that we have that's a, a state mandated preference category is um, veterans. and. Um, and every veteran that is either chosen in a lottery or applies to a, a, uh, an open lottery, uh, to an open waiting list is given the preference category. So they may have to wait because there might be 15 veterans who, um, who are selected in a lottery. So depending on their number, they'll have to wait, but they will, they get the first preference. Is there, uh, is, uh, is the administration supportive of this bill? Um, we're supportive of transparency. Um, because we're moving to Housing Connect 2.0, to go backwards and count, particularly some of these very long waiting lists, it, um, it, I don't think it will achieve what, you know, what we're looking for in terms of moving to Housing Connect 2.0. We're working very, very closely with um, Associate Commissioner Brown's unit and just putting Sorry, that together. My time is running out. I didn't know if that was a no or a yes. So the answer is um, we're supportive of transparency. We're not supportive of the way that, but we're not supportive of the direct bill, the way that it's um, composed, because we're looking at going forward. You don't, you're opposed because you don't want to go backwards, is that what it is? That I think that what you're looking for will not, that we will get going forward. Oh, okay, 
Well, I'll be happy. I want to continue the conversation. I'm, I'm interested about some of the past ones as well, but I'm interested. Um, but I did, just for my last few remaining seconds, want to talk about uh, Council Member Salamanca's bill. It's going to mostly a comment. I'm, I'm just proud to be on that bill. Um, we, obviously, we can't build our way out of the problem, but to the extent that we are building, we have to make sure um, that uh, we're building for the people who need it. I don't think that has occurred, and I've been quite clear about that. My hope is that this body at some point will open, reopen MIH, uh, because I think it was a debacle from the beginning. I'd like to see a moratorium on MIH, and I just supported a group of housing advocates to have a racial impact study on every zone that happens in this in the city. Uh, and I hope that we will count um, toward uh, subsidies uh, rezonings as well because landlords, um, developers are getting subsidy whether it's not, uh, whether it's direct or not. And I know we've tried to fix a lot of it with the term sheets, uh, <coughs> but uh, it's not, the band-aid approach is not working. So whether it's this bill or MIH, we have to do a lot more and the housing plan is not where it needs to be. Uh, I think I'm, I'm a broken record at this, uh, at, some, at this point in time, but uh, the things that we've pointed out from years ago have proven to be true. So I hope the administration supports this bill and all others like it. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, um, in terms of using the broken record analogy, I think we have to come up with a better analogy for millennials because they don't know what that really means. So. A repeated stream. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, the question that I had was, um, do, do we know how many veterans there are on the list that we discussed earlier? Um, I can get you the numbers of veterans who were um, who were given housing um, over the, since the veterans bill went into effect. Um, you know, I can get that that number for you. Okay, thank you. I'd like that. Okay. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. We're going to um, move into the uh, public testimony portion of this and call the first panel. Uh, Giselle. Rothier and Joshua Goldfein, Nathalyn Flowers, Peter Malvan, Wendy O'Shields, and Annette Tomlin will be our first panel. And please excuse the um, mispronunciation of any names. Uh, in the interim, I do ask that as, as much of the administration that can remain to hear the testimony, please be able to do that. We have several panels. We're going to ask that the uh, public comments be put on a clock for two minutes. Uh, I'm not sure if I mispronounced a name or two, but we seem to be missing some panelists. Um, Annette Tomlin. She won't be. She left? She's not testifying. Okay. Today. Okay. okay then. Thank you. So we're good. Sure. We should stop someone else and do another panel. Uh, Annie Carforo. Thank you. So we can begin um, at either end or wherever you guys want to start. Hi, everybody. My name is Giselle Ruth here. I'm the policy director at the Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, we've submitted joint testimony with the Legal Aid Society. 
And I'm going to summarize our testimony here, but we thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. We're going to be talking about Councilmember Salamanca's bill, Intro 1211, uh, as well as the, the broader issue of homelessness in New York City. I want to start by saying that we can't forget that we're currently experiencing record homelessness in New York City. We've hit new records for the past several months. Uh, there are now 63,600 people sleeping in shelters every single night. This is a new all-time record. Um, and I think this underscores the fact that Mayor de Blasio's plan to help reduce homelessness is not working. Um, when he initiated the Turning the Tide plan in 2017, uh, he said he would reduce the shelter census by 2,500 people over five years. We're already going in the wrong direction. And so we're here to talk about the importance of adding uh, a critical piece of the housing plan in order to address homelessness in New York City because homelessness is ultimately a function of the availability of low-income housing. So broadly, uh, we and 60 partner organizations along with 38 elected officials, um, including Councilmember Salamanca, have been part of this larger coalition called the House Our Future in New York campaign uh, where we've been calling on the mayor to dedicate 30,000 units of the Housing New York plan for homeless households, but specifically 24,000 of those to be of the new construction. So that works out to be about 20% of all new construction going forward for homeless households. That's critically important because, as was mentioned earlier, the preservation units are largely already occupied. And so um, those units don't present an opportunity to have move somebody off the streets or from the shelter system into a housing unit. And so we really think the focus here is important to, to keep on new construction and to make sure a significant and meaningful portion of those are dedicated specifically to homeless households. So we believe that Intro 1211, uh, we fully support it, is a great uh, practical tool to help us get to that goal. Um, right now, there actually is no across-the-board set-aside requirement um, for term sheets uh, for units that are financed. Um, and in, in many cases, some are negotiated down. And through data that we had gotten from HPD under their mix and match term sheet, which has a 10% set aside, so far less than 5% of units created under that program have been for homeless units. So that's an example. Um, so I'll wrap up, but um, Josh will talk a little bit about some of the reporting things that we recommend. This is Josh Goldfein from the Legal Aid Society. Thank you for your op the opportunity to testify. Uh, as Giselle said, we submitted joint written testimony. Um, I just want to highlight um, that we support generally the goal of transparency um, and in having that numbers uh, put forward. It's, it's very important to focus on, uh, however, which are the relevant numbers. We heard a, a lot of testimony about how many units were preserved, how many units were financed, um, but uh, w what snuck in there um, was, uh, I think we heard that uh, there was a question that I believe Councilmember Salamaca asked, which was how many people have actually moved into units uh, so far in this administration, and the answer was 1,700. Now, it took us a while to get that number. Um, we actually had to file a lawsuit when the agency would not re reveal those numbers to us and, and claim they didn't track them that way. Um, eventually, though, uh, and the number that's in our testimony is 1,660. I'll accept that maybe there have been some more since they turned those numbers over to us. But uh, when the agency talks about preserving units, certainly it is uh, very important to ensure that buildings remain affordable and that people who are, have been in communities can remain in those communities, that people are not forced out of their homes. Um, those are all important objectives, but at the same time, as Giselle said, we have a record shelter census at this time, we have a homeless crisis, and the city needs to be doing everything it can to ensure that people who are homeless have a place to go. We are not going to empty the shelter system if we don't have places for people to move into, and HPD to date, again, the number is 1,700 since the start of the administration. 1,700 households have moved out of shelter into HPD apartments. When you compare to what HRA, DHS, DSS has done, that's a drop in the bucket. And so that side of the administration has really got to step up uh, and increase the numbers of units that are available for people who are in shelter to move out of, or we're going to just have a permanent shelter population forever. Thank you. Um, so, so you mentioned the number 1,700. Do you know of that number? Uh, how many are supportive housing and how many are general? Uh, those are all general, so those are the non-supportive housing units. So, so is the administration going to argue that there's a, a huge number that are supportive housing and, and we're not reporting, and that number's not reported in that? I mean, one, one thing that we want to uh, ensure that the, uh, is properly reported and is in the bills is to distinguish the actual number of units that are being created at any given time. We have um, units being financed 
through a number of different programs by the city, by the state, and we want to make sure that units aren't being double counted. So it's, it's very important to look at not just how many are financed, how many are uh, for preservation, but how many households are actually moving from shelter into an apartment. And those are numbers, I think you're absolutely right, that we have to press them to account and not double count so that we know how much the city is actually investing in getting people out of the shelter system so that we can bring down the numbers of people in shelter. So, so I do, I do uh, respect that some of the um, administration has stayed to hear your testimony. Do you guys know offhand of that 1,700 number, I'm sorry, outside of the 1,700 number, what the number for supportive housing units that people have actually moved from, um, from shelter into um, HPD apartments? Um. So I'm sorry. The the uh, this this is unprecedented, by the way. So, so <laughs> what, what we're witnessing right here. So. We're happy to share a table with you. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the uh, supportive housing placements are not done in conjunction with our office. Supportive housing placements are done uh, directly by DSS. So we do not have that number. Um, the 17 is for the general purpose projects um, that we work in conjunction with DSS to um, make placements. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. So does, so does the, the DSS number not count in your overall number? The DSS number does not count in the 1700. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Wendy O'Shields, and I'm a safety net activist, founding member, and a housing advocate. Please integrate the HUD Housing First and Rapid Rehousing models into intro Bill 1211 opt for less shelter residents and shorter shelter residencies. The City of New York Department of Homeless Services single adults that are literally homeless, truly homeless, or chronically homeless languish in shelters for five, seven, or more years. During the multitude of a resident of, um, during a multitude of years, a resident's health degrades, family and friends' relationships become estranged, and their community network becomes no longer viable. HUD Housing First and Rapid Rehousing removes barriers to independent or supportive housing for homeless and averts long shelter stays. HUD housing and rapid rehousing rapidly connects homeless in shelter or NYC streets to independent or supportive permanent housing as eligible. HUD housing first and rapid rehousing understands that prolonged homelessness has a significant negative effect on human beings. Intro 1211 homeless assessment should include the length of stay in DHS shelters or NYC streets when prioritizing homeless for homeless set-aside apartments. Currently, there's no time metric enforced for a Department of Homeless Services single adult residents eligible for independent housing. The length of residency in shelters is not applied to an immediacy to quickly house single adults independently. DHS shelter lengths of stay beyond 24 months has become a concern to continue the HUD McKinney Vento payments for homeless residents. This usually triggers an, a DHS administrative transfer to their next home shelter. Many single adult residents are routinely ignored by DHS housing specialists or staff at, and reside in shelters approaching decades. Thank you for your thoughtful review of my suggestions and my enclosed documents. Thank you. Have you submitted, you submitted that for yes. us? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Nathalie Flowers out of Shagan. Uh, I'm a member of Vocal New York, Voices of the Community Activists and Leaders. I wanna thank the chair, Robert Cornegy, and the other members of this committee for the opportunity to provide testimony. And I especially wanna thank uh, the chair, uh, council member Salamanca, for, uh, for introducing Intro 1211. Volcker New York is a part of How's Our Future New York campaign. The campaign has been working tirelessly to win more housing for homeless New Yorkers. In October, I confronted Mayor de Blasio at the gym in Park Slope. 
to ask him to set aside. Oh, wait, wait, that, that was you? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I spoke very quietly. <laughs> I did not scream at him. Uh, to ask him to set aside 30,000 units of his 300,000 units. He only provided 5% or um, for us, 15,000. We asked him to double that to 10% or 30,000 of the 300,000. 24,000 to be created through new construction. Later, I joined hundreds of people as we marched to Gracie Mansion. Then Council Member Salamanca introduced this critical bill, intro 1211, that will get us closer to our goal. Triple what the mayor was asking, 15%. We met with the administration, we had press conferences, we even risked arrest Councilman Salamanca and our, we did a sit-in right in front of the mayor's office. We couldn't get arrested. We just couldn't. But to say this has got to be addressed, you have to got, you've got to stop sweeping this under the rug. We believe it's something simple. The housing plan should help New Yorkers who need the most help. My story of homelessness started in February 2015 when I was evicted from my um, apartment of 34 and a half years. My rent ran from 475 to 1319 a month as I lost my rent stabilization. And I've been in shelter for three years. Shelter has 23,000 children, 63,000 of us, and we know there's more than 68,000 in the state. But what I want you to know is that we need your help. We need this bill passed. We need effective ways of changing this because otherwise 63,000 of us will continue to sleep in shelters every night. And I want to thank you for supporting Councilman Salamanca's bill and supporting us to get us into permanent housing. Two billion dollars plus a year is too much to just spend for beds. That's squandering our wealth and our taxpayer dollars. And we could use it better to put us all in permanent housing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and your uh, advocacy. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon. My name is Annie Carforo, and I'm a community organizer with Neighbors Together. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee today to support Intro 1211. Neighbors Together is a soup kitchen and community-based organization located in central Brooklyn. In the last four years, our members have overwhelmingly identified the affordable housing and homelessness crisis as the most pressing issue they face. The mayor's claims that his administration is doing enough for homeless New Yorkers, that his affordable housing plan is doing enough, is gravely out of touch with the severity of this growing crisis. Neighbors Together strongly supports Intro 1211. Rising rents and the increasing cost of living are displacing longtime residents and pushing them into the shelter system. The mandated 15% homeless set aside in new developments would create a critically needed increase in units for people in the shelter system or on the streets. and would help ensure that all neighborhoods maintain some semblance of economic diversity and help prevent resident displacement. Long-term investment in housing, extremely low income bands of the AMI will also provide a return on investment. Currently, the city spends approximately $5,760 per month to shelter individuals at a cost of $70,000 per year. That does not include the hidden costs of homelessness, loss of employment and educational opportunities due to appointments with HRA and DHS, travel time and expense from shelter to children's schools, doctors, and other networks and supports, cost of storage or loss of belongings while homeless, theft in shelters, trauma and mental health stressors from being in crowded and understaffed sh shelters, including increased likelihood of substance use and overdose, recidivism, et cetera. Over the course of Neighbors Together's 36 year history, time and again we have seen that safe, permanent housing is the key to stability. Stable housing is the foundation from which all other things are possible. Neighbors Together is a lead participant in the House Our Future New York campaign, which calls on the mayor to set aside 30,000 units of his affordable housing plan for homeless New Yorkers and make sure that 24,000 of those are new construction. Intro 1211 would help us get to this critically important goal. We're in the midst of a homeless crisis on a scale not seen since the Great Depression, and now is the time for bold action. We and our members call on the City Council to pass Intro 1211 immediately. The 63,000 people living in the city shelter system depend on it. Thank you for your time. Thank you all so much for your testimony uh, and your advocacy, especially uh, around this very important issue. So let me get this straight. That's a yes on 1211 for the enti entire panel? Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank We're you. I'm going to call our second panel. Mauricio Hernandez Tapiero, Leroy Alexander, Victoria Wolf, and Sheila Martin. I'm sorry. And. Uh, Nicole McVincie,
Uh, I'm going to also ask uh, Robert Altman to join this panel. And as soon as Mr. Altman is seated, we can begin. I would like to remind you that we have two more panels, so if you can keep your testimonies uh, passionate and concise, uh, we can hear everyone's voice today. We have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Is, is why I'm trying to urge everyone to be clear and concise. I believe you can be passionate and clear and concise. We can begin. Hello. Good morning. My name is Leroy Alexander, and I'm a leader with Neighbors Together's Community Action Program, and I'm also a formerly homeless person. I'm here today to urge City Council to pass Intro 1211 to help homeless New Yorkers move into permanent housing. I first became homeless in 2001 when I was asked to leave a three-quarter house in the Bronx where I was residing at the time. I've been homeless on three different occasions, totaling almost two years. During that time, I lived in two drop-in centers and four different shelters. Now, I've been living in a housing unit through a supportive housing program for the last six and a half years. While it isn't perfect, at least I have a place to go that I can sit at home and I live with dignity. The homelessness crisis in NYC today is as insidious as the AIDS epidemic, which was another dark, was another dark period in time that we've seen. It has a cause, a prevention, and a cure. And now it needs to be prioritized by our government and elected officials. Very few of you here today can understand the true nature of homelessness if you haven't experienced it firsthand. However, you can end the instability and trauma experienced by more than 63,000 New Yorkers by passing Intro 1211 into law. I'm here to be a voice for the thousands of homeless people who cannot be here to tell their own stories. Homelessness is an all-consuming and disrupts lives in unimaginable ways. I was fortunate to receive a place to call home, and it is quite reasonable to say that it saved my life. And I can sit here and speak to you all today because I have my basic human needs met. I hope you all understand that homelessness has no face, no stereotype, and is native to no particular segment of the population. New York is changing and developing at a rapid pace, and more than 63,000 New Yorkers, many of whom are lifetime residents, many of whom work to make this city run, are relying on the city that they have given so much to to give something back. Suffice to say that Intro 1211 can be the salvation of either yourself or someone you care about. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Once again, my name is Leroy Alexander. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Alexander. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nicole McVinnio, and I'm the policy analyst at Urban Pathways. And on behalf of the organization, thank you for the opportunity to testify in Intro 1211 today. Urban Pathways is a nonprofit that provides services to chronically homeless individuals uh, through a unique combination of street outreach, safe havens, extended stay residences, permanent supportive housing, and employment programs. We meet individuals where they're at in their lives, provide them with a range of services appropriate to their needs, and assist them in gaining permanent housing. Uh, this last piece of our work, assisting individuals in gaining permanent housing, has proven increasingly difficult. Um, it's especially difficult for those who are classified as general population and don't qualify for supportive housing, nor need the services provided in supportive housing. Um, this is why we adamantly support Intro 1211. Uh, New York, as you know, is in the midst of an affordable housing crisis. According to findings from the 2017 New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey, the vacancy rate for units with asking rents of less than $800 per month was just 1.15%, and apartments ranging between $800 and $999 per month had a vacancy rate of only 2.1%. Um, according to the Comptroller's The Gap is Still Growing report, there was a loss of over 425,000 apartments renting for $900 or less since 2005. This is incredibly low vacancy rate and shrinking stock of affordable housing makes it extremely difficult for people to exit homelessness. Uh, meanwhile, our shelter population is growing. 63,000 adults and children sleep in city shelters each night, and their stays are getting longer. The average stay of single adults and families in DHS shelter extends beyond a year. 
Um, Intro 1211 would be an impactful step towards the creation of more affordable housing uh, that will get people out of shelters and into a home. Uh, it cannot be the only one though, as a lead organization of the How's Our Future New York campaign, we're also calling on the mayor, as you heard from the coalition, to set aside 30,000 units of his committed 300,000 units of affordable housing to homeless households. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and we sincerely hope the council will pass Intro 1211. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robert Altman. I am a legislative consultant to the Queens and Bronx Building Association. As currently constituted, we do not support the bills here today. Our number one issue is with Intro 1211. It is not that we oppose a set aside, it's the question of where is the money going to come from. All of these projects have a specific economic mix to make them affordable. I think you do know that already. But unless we have a plan to, in fact, come up with a way to get the money so that it, there is additional funds available, simply putting a set aside of 15% does not do anything. It, in fact, all it would do is actually decrease the amount of units created. Rather than be negative, I'd like to make a suggestion is that the council come forward with a bill that would, in fact, put the onus back upon the administration requiring the administration to come forward with a plan sometime in the next six months and report back to the council on how it would achieve this goal. You can then, then in fact, talk about whether the number is 15% or 10% has been discussed here a bit today and then figure out where you're going from there. With respect to the um, Affordable Housing Task Force, I would like to point out that our membership actually has a bit of a problem. We actually get too many applications for lotteries, and many of them are not, how shall we say, uh, meeting the criteria of the project. Um, and often we'll be going through thousands and thousands of applications in order to meet the couple of dozen or the 50 or the 60 that we have in our projects. And the issue is not one of access. It's almost as if too much access has been granted because, because people are applying again and again and again for projects they have no intention of going to. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective, actually. Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Wolf. I'm a member of Neighbors Together Community Action Program. We, we can't hear you. I need you to push the button. Oh, okay. Thank you. Should I repeat? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Wolf. I am a member of Neighbors Together Community Action Program. I am here today to ask City Council to pass Intro 1211 to help all homeless New Yorkers. I am also here to be the voice for many thousands of homeless people who cannot be here today to tell their own stories. I have experienced many degrading, unsafe behaviors in situations in the drop-in centers and shelters in which I have resided. We have nowhere to turn, no one to turn to, and this is a very profound hardship. I know this bill is an opportunity for hope because as a voucher owner since 2017, I have come to learn that the harsh realities of the voucher program and that vouchers are really a, only a piece of paper. Because there is a lack of enforcement against discriminating landlords that treat us like second-class second citizens, we need something to be done. Trying to use city vouchers is like trying, trying to Excuse me, trying to use the city vouchers to find housing leaves you feeling defeated, hopeless, and trapped in a system without dignity. Our elected officials have only given us empty promises. The system that you have placed is not working, and it leads many people to suffer. In a homeless crisis, this is worse than the Great Depression. We need bold action. We need to value people above profits. We need to prioritize getting the 63,000 people living in our shelter system out of it. And we need to do it now. Please pass Intro 1211. 
which would greatly benefit everyone's lives. Tens of thousands of homeless New Yorkers are depending on it. We thank you, respectfully, Victoria Wolf. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Wolf. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mauricio Hernandez. I am from Colombia. I am an immigrant, and now I'm a homeless since August 2018. Uh, I came from Philadelphia looking for the new opportunities of job here in, the, in New York. Sorry for my broken English. I try to be clear at, uh, at least. Uh, everything, when I came here, was stolen. My documents, my ID from Colombia, ID from the United States, my papers, my clothes, my uh, cell phone, my money, so I get a homeless suddenly. I didn't realize that, uh, but I was trying to get help some, from some organizations, and they sent me to the shelter. And the main shelter, I was attacked. I almost died because I, every bones of my face were broken, and I, ho I was in the hospital for 10 days, and I got the surgery in my face. Now I'm looking better, you can see that. Uh, and after that, I was uh, from the Holy, the Church of the Holy Apostles sent me to, or contact me for any, any kind of organization that help homeless. But uh, until now, after many, many cars, business cars, many, many promises, I'm here, I'm still sleeping on the street. Like a thousand of people on the street now in the winter. So I have to say thanks for some generous people and some churches that help me with clothes, with shoes, and with some food. But I need the real solutions about a place to sleep. Like a thousand of New Yorkers here. So uh, I have been at the hospital more than five times because of my uh, attack. I have some side effects in my brain. So I lost my conscious, I lost my balance when I walk in, I'm losing my vision. So any, all the time in this process of healing of my face and my body, I have been sleeping on the street. So I just want to ask everybody a question because the question is, do you really know how hard is a sleeping on the street in winter? No. You would just know this real feeling if you had slept at least one night in the street of New York. So think about the solution. We could need a solution, a real solution. People who have the control to make it laws and to make this moving, please move this so fast. Please, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I'm sorry for your uh, experience and your attack. Thank you. We are going to move to the next panel. Uh, this looks like Matteo Dunbar. Scott Hutchins, Catherine Trapani, uh, Rakuba Basir, uh, Queen Mother Lucy Woody. Good afternoon, you can begin your testimony when you're ready. And if you could just do me a favor before your testimony, if you'd identify yourself. So then. Good afternoon, my name is Rakiba Basir. Um, I live in supportive housing, a nonprofit which is contracted with the city. Uh, right now, I'm living under substandard conditions with the Urban Pathways Organization where I reside at. I was, uh, what is happening, the city has been 
70 residents like myself, people formerly incarcerated. I was wrongfully convicted. I'm still challenging that as we speak. But what is happening is that instead of affording a permanent housing for individuals like myself coming out of the prison and coming out of the show and going into the shelter system, there, I've been home eight years. I have not as of yet received permanent housing, nor have I been given a voucher. And what's been happening is that the city has been contracting. I'm not gonna to totally accrue full blame to Mayor de Blasio, although I'm disappointed that he came with this prog progressive agenda saying that he was going to assist in the homeless crisis here in New York. Apparently, he has not delivered. I am still in a homeless uh, scattered site shelter apartment under substandard conditions. Um, the SROs have become uh, how, how can I describe it? As drug houses, okay? I'm constantly subjected to people exposing their private parts, men in particular. I have a present situation going in now where my safety is being compromised. Uh, I, I'm com constantly subjected to crack K2 and cigarettes on a regular basis in a non-smoking SRO building. I don't know who's responsible totally. I have made almost a two-year report of um, 311 calls to no avail. Nothing has been addressed. The Department of Buildings, for some reason, have moved, removed certain violations they have not addressed. I'm advocating as not only a safety net activist, but also a, a individual who was formerly incarcerated, who has been struggling for eight years now to successfully reacclimate, that you do support and introduce a bill of Rafael Salamanca, and that's 1211. It is, hum it is definitely needed. Also to consider the fact that, too, that supportive housing was introduced by Senator Bento and Senator, Senator McKinney at one point for the purposes of individuals like myself to be able to establish themselves once they're released. Apparently, there's others that are coming behind me who are still not established yet and have not been able to successfully reacclimate due to the breakdown in the system of the supportive housing. So. Ms. Basile, what, what borough are you in? I'm in Harlem, I'm in Manhattan, sir. Okay. And I have reached out to Mayor de Blasio's office on numerous occasions. In fact, I went to one of the 35th town hall meetings and spoke to him and Commissioner Banks. Now, I'm not here to ostracize anybody, but I would like for people to keep their word. I should not remain in the same predicament that I am. A year ago, I had pacemaker surgery, and the conditions that I'm living on is not, is not conducive for my health or anybody else's as I speak. Nobody's not addressing them, not the mayor's office, not the Department of Health, not the Department of Buildings, not DHS, who placed me in this precarious situation. I need permanent housing, and I'm proposing to you to please support Rafael Salamanca's bill, 1211. Thank you so much for your You're testimony. Welcome. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Sheila Martin, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the New York City Housing Partnership, New York City's primary nonprofit intermediary for the affordable housing. In our more than 36-year history, the Housing Partnership has served as the nonprofit sponsor in the development and preservation of more than 70,000 affordable home ownership and rental units throughout the five boroughs, and leveraged over $7 billion in private sector financing. I'm here to register concerns about some of the details in the proposal of Intro 1211. We've had conversations with the le uh, legislative staff and we were told today that Intro 1211 will only be um, relevant to uh, rental housing, no longer uh, um, home ownership. However, some more clarity is needed. As currently drafted, Intro 12, 1211 does not require any additional funding to be attached to the units for formerly homeless households. While many households depend departing the sh shelter systems are move-in ready and do not require a fully supportive housing 
living situation. The screening process is opaque and needs more transparency. Households departing the house homeless shelter systems are on a continuum of services where some will require a variety of services and follow up by professionals. Indeed, anecdotally, we can report that it is the formerly homeless households that have the highest turnover in affordable housing projects, which we believe is connected to the fact that there is little or no support once families have been placed in housing. It is the goal of not only the families, but also the building owners as well, that placements required by this new set aside have every chance to be successful and long lasting. It must be addressed how formerly homeless individuals and families are screened to determine if they are in need of special services to be properly housed and how additional services will be provided. A fiscal impact analysis to both property owners and agencies charged with housing homeless individuals and families must be conducted, which will include whether additional financial sources will be made available by the City of New York to ensure that these projects are economically feasible. If so, this will require a committed source of multi-year funding. Next, we feel more clarity is needed in order to understand how a set-aside would function with respect to preservation as required by the legislation. We have questions as to what preservation events would trigger the requirement, how it would work with respect to unit vacancy, and many other logistical concerns for this complex and unique part of the affordable housing universe. Finally, it is our understanding that HPD has raised concerns about changes to their program's term sheets being legislated by the council in a way that removes the agency's flexibility, particularly in the event of a major market event like the Great Recession of 2008. We share in that concern and are willing to be stakeholders in any process that examines ways to meet this necessary 15% set-aside goal in a way that allows the city to maintain this flexibility. We also have concerns about other bills being processed in this council, which have to do with a number of uh, subjects, including the marketing enhancements. But since time is running out, I'll leave it at that. Uh, my name is Scott Andrew Hutchins, and I've been a member of Picture the Homeless for the past six years. May 25th, 2019 will be the seventh anniversary of my entry into the shelter system. I'm living in my ninth shelter as I write this with no end in sight, having been denied disability on the grounds that I can do a desk job. My 2005 master's degree from CUNY being enticing to employers, no matter how much Navient pursues me. On my Instagram, one can see numerous pictures I took outside the Park Slope YMCA as part of the support contingency when Nathan Flowers and Paulette Soltani confronted the Mayor de Blasio at his workout. To date, I believe I can safely say that de Blasio has created zero units of housing that are affordable to me or any of the homeless activists with whom I work. No one I know in my homeless activism has been held by the housing vouchers due to source of income discrim discrimination and the fervor of shelter staff for me to take time off any new temporary or freelance job with a letter from an overly enthusiastic new employer who predicts more hours than they can provide or the bizarre assumption that an employer who hires me for a project will automatically be able to find other work with which to keep me employed if I do well, even with my last two employers being nonprofits. From that as a case study, it's clear that 15% of units set aside for the homeless is a reasonable demand. What is unreasonable is de Blasio's belief that a significant portion of housing subsidies go to, go to people making six figures. In a period of low homelessness, this seems like a stretch, but with homelessness reaching Great Depression era levels and exceeding 60,000 people, 23,000 of them children, this is unconscionable and certainly defies any definition of the term progressive as I know it. The only person I know who won a housing lottery was still homeless last I heard. He could not meet the requirements and ultimately lost. Given the rarity of obtaining apartments by this method, and homelessness must be going up at its most extreme rate ever if Stephen Banks' claim of 90,000 housed with city vouchers is true, de Blasio's solution to homelessness has not brought the number of homeless New Yorkers down. Eliminating homelessness will require action on the level of Salt Lake City's Housing First program in order to have a measurable success. A 15% homeless set-aside would be New York City's first big step toward that model. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Matthew Dunbar. I'm the Vice President of External Affairs for Habitat for Humanity New York City. Um, I'm going to uh, summarize my, my comments uh, as I'm uh, legally blind. And I actually want to echo a lot of um, Sheila's comments in relation to the, the home ownership piece of this. And, and from uh, the council member uh, Salamanca's uh, comments, it does appear that the, uh, the bill will uh, be amended uh, to be identifying uh, primarily as a rental uh, program, which we greatly support. Habitat for Humanity New York City has uh, built and preserved over 700 units of affordable home ownership um, throughout the city through both single and multifamily affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, but we also recognize uh, with the scale of the housing crisis in New York City that everybody must do more, and we appreciate um, the goals of the bill. Uh, and we are actually currently involved as a co-develop in our, in our first rental uh, project, which uh, will be under the HPD SARA term sheet and have a 30% set aside for formerly homeless seniors uh, and is located in the Little, e Little Italy neighborhood of, of Manhattan. And we greatly appreciate uh, Councilmember Chin's support of that project and uh, request that um, uh, folks uh, check out havengreencommunity.nyc uh, for details on that, on that project. Um, but we also want to um, express uh, potential concerns just over um, the size of the projects that are uh, included in the, uh, in the set-aside to ensure that um, there is enough funding uh, for projects that may be of smaller nature, and especially under the preservation program, that there be more detail, as many of the preservation programs that are accessed are accessed by low-income uh, cooperatives uh, that may have additional uh, restrictions and requirements in order to keep those buildings sustainable. Uh, so we, I, we thank you for uh, the Council's work and prioritization of this issue and uh, are available for any questions. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Catherine Trapani and I'm the Executive Director of Homeless Services United. We are a coalition of nonprofit, mission driven uh, shelter outreach uh, prevention providers, um, and I am here today to testify about Intro 1211. Um, the crisis of homelessness, as we've heard today, impacts around 63,000 New Yorkers using DHS shelters every night. Um, but I do want to note for the record that the number of homeless uh, New Yorkers is actually quite a bit higher if you factor in persons using the domestic violence, youth shelter systems, and folks living on the street. And the numbers that were just reported to HUD were nearly 79,000 people homeless on any given night. Uh, on, I'm sorry, not any given night, uh, the point in time count uh, last year. So um, when we say that the crisis of homelessness is at a record level, um, it is really quite serious and often underreported. Um, the mayor's plan to address homelessness, dubbed Turning the Tide, does a number of important things that the administration deserves credit for. Um, there has been increased uh, homeless prevention services, increased outreach, uh, improved shelter, and uh, some permanent housing initiatives that are worth noting. And so I want to respect the administration when they've said that they've done a lot. Um, they have. Um, the mayor has also championed a very large affordable housing plan uh, with a promise to build a preserve 300,000 units of affordable housing. And so while that number pledged is certainly impressive and in theory could be a boon to help address the homeless crisis, when you dig in to who the housing is actually being built for, it becomes clear that there is a mismatch between the need and the number of units being produced. Um, the New York Times actually did a story on lotteries that I read online on Friday. Um, and they talked about landlords marketing these affordable units that they're creating on websites like Street Easy and similar platforms to attract applicants looking for market rate homes, given that the prices are typically no, long, uh, no lower than what's actually available on the open market. And so while we appreciate that New Yorkers of all walks of life need housing, and some, like one of the women profiled in the article, would like to trade up to a more luxurious home, there really is this mismatch between where our taxpayer dollars are going on the affordable housing production and the and the the level of the crisis of homelessness. And so I just want to express my very strong support for setting a 15% uh, set aside as a, as a floor. Um, and if we could actually align the housing plan and the homeless plan, we could do a heck of a lot more than just turn the tide on homelessness. We could actually start to end it. Thank you. Thank you. Your recommendations are duly, duly noted. Thank you all for your advocacy and your testimony here today. I'm going to call um, what seems to be the last panel of the day. Stephanie Sosa, Carolyn Brown, Paula Fields, and Lyric Thompson.
can begin your testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Cornegie and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee for this opportunity to testify. My name is Stephanie Sosa, and I am the Senior Associate for Housing Development Policy at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. We are a coalition of over 100 mission-driven local nonprofit groups across New York City who do affordable housing, economic development, organizing, and also provide social services. We're here to show our support for two bills today. ANHD supports the efforts of city, of city council member Salamanca to address the homeless crisis by passing intro 1211. New York City must do all that it can to address the growing severity of the homeless crisis. Our member groups believe that there are certain technical and operational issues that should be addressed. That includes the underwriting process, financing for this program, questions about marketing, how the approach should be applied in preservation deals and also in new construction deals, and what the term sheet requirements would be in an uncertain funding environment. We encourage HPD and City Council to jointly and quickly work through these issues, and we are happy to offer our expertise of our member groups so that we can be helpful in making this requirement work. We also want to show our support for Council Member Levin's bill, Intro 550. We believe that the task force can analyze both the mechanics and the overall fairness of the housing lottery system. Our members have shown concerns for several issues, including barrier to access, paper applications, rejections, transparency in the process, public notices, data collection, and education about the lottery process to constituents. An appointed group of housing lottery experts can study these issues, prioritize, and make strategic rec recommendations for housing lottery reform. ANHD and our member groups look forward to working with Council Member Levin and the Housing and Building Committee in order to improve the housing lottery system, and we hope that our expertise is helpful to creating fair opportunities for New Yorkers who desperately need affordable housing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carolyn Brown. Um, I came in with Ms. Flowers. I'm at Pam's place. Um, I would consider myself the new face of mental illness. Um, I came in to say um, I have one of those voucher city FEPs, and here's 59th Street. With this being said, myself and my son, <clears throat> if we get called, you know, for the lottery, it says uh, tenant process, and he's at Covenant House, and again, I'm at uh, Pam's place with Ms. Flowery. We need to know that if we are, you know, if we're entitled to this, do we come in? Will this voucher of 1,246 also allow my son to come in with me? What part of our incomes are we gonna be allowed to use? And then, you know, Social Security. Just suppose, with my Social Security, they find out that I can get a job working with the United States Post Office and I'm a labor custodian. How much are they gonna take? What do we qualify for? If we do move into 59th Street in Manhattan, are we gonna pay additional fees for him to use a music or an art studio? There's a lot of things that are going on. This homeless situation that we have, I, I never mean to be rude toward anybody. I'm just flabbergasted. I come from 116 Williams, which is an assessment shelter and also Bronx for the women. And they're telling us monthly that they get five grand. And I'm thinking just woosah. You're gonna pay for me to be in a shelter and stay off the street 5,000, but you won't pay to keep me from being homeless when I live in Albany, New York. So I have to run back down here to change my situation. Again, I need to breathe in and out, and I'm asking again, there's a lot of confusion here for me. With these assessment shelters, with the places they, they put us in, Pam's place is mixed population. I'm having a hard time adjusting once again. I came out of New York City housing as of October 2017. We actually met Ms. Carlina Rivera. She came to our meetings. We helped get her to city council. So she saw me at the door and she's like, if I you know, can help you, just call. She did remember. I wanted to say thank you guys for listening. There's a lot of confusion, but thank you for keeping us off the street. Thank you. Uh, so at, at, at Pam's place, is there a, is there a, a counselor or someone that's helping you try to navigate all of that confusion? There's um, a woman named Miss Still. She's trying to be as polite as she can. She gave me the um, city FEPS voucher. I had to go to the fair hearings, and with no disrespect, 
fair hearing conciliation is in the welfare center. They were giving me such the runaround. I stated to them, I don't want to be one of this, the clients who lies, but I get Social Security, so they had to readjust it. Since you're getting Social Security, we don't give you funding like cash or we slow down your food stamps so we can get this done. Fair hearing conciliation in the building. We did the work. Food stamps is cut off right now until they get the work done. Yes, Ms. Still is trying to help me, but with the city FEPS, I'm still entitled to something called the 2010E. You have to forgive me, again, not being rude. I have a psychiatrist that I see once every two months. She's very, very gracious. When you feel better and you're not sick, the cancer is gone, go back and apply for school, but now isn't a good time. With Ms. Still, you, you have to forgive me. At Pam's place, they're more, I would consider, Let's get them out. Let's show them that we're working. I don't think the 2010E would be good for me because myself and my son, we're on this city FEPS. We're applying. How, how old is your son? My son's 19. He's at Covenant House. Mm -hmm. We're applying for the HPD housing. Once they do call us in, they have this process that says tenant selection. They would be calling us for either 30th Street or Pacific Street in Brooklyn. He has to say if he wants this because um, he just got Social Security as of January. So. They're trying to help, but I don't want to be one of those people like the woman was saying in that scattered type. I don't want to be forced into, you have to forgive me for being rude. I don't want to be forced into a situation where people are allowed to smoke crack in the building because security won't come upstairs and check the rooms. I'm, I'm sorry. I just wrote the coalition. I wrote the Department of Homeless Services. Ms. Still wants to help. I am, I'm sorry, Mr. Hornsby. Hornsby. Cornegie. Cornegie. I'm sorry, I'm gonna be sort of like her. I'm gonna be forced into a situation because they need the numbers to go. I don't want that. Okay, thank you, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, sir. Good morning, my name is, good afternoon, I'm sorry. My name is Paula Fields and I am a board member of Community Board 2 in the Bronx and I'm also the president of the Precinct Council in my district. I'm a constituent of Councilman Rafael Salamanca, and I'm in support of his bill 1211. I volunteer once a month on a Friday. I go out into Hunts Point and I deliver, I cook, prepare, and deliver food to the homeless. There's nothing that could really set your heart aside than to see someone homeless out in the freezing, it's freezing snow, it's raining, and they are out in the street sleeping on a blanket and plastic. This homeless situation is totally just inhumane. It's just horrible that we, average citizens, could allow this to get to this, this catastrophe. Um, HPD has failed me as a citizen, as a taxpayer of New York City. I've tried to get into H, I've applied I could tell you how many times I have not to this day gotten an apartment. Um, that lottery system is a joke. It's nothing but a joke. We need to have a, a, a policy or something where someone on a housing community in each community board be at the table with HPD when they're pulling these applications because the 50% priority doesn't happen in my neighborhood. I'm sorry, I have done many of surveys of tenants that moved into my district and these new developments, and none of them come from community, well, maybe two of them, I'm sorry, in one building, came from community board two, and most of them come from Brooklyn. And I stand to be corrected. I have gotten um, called for an apartment, but in Queens. I lived in the South Bronx when it was burning down. I advocated for housing for and still have uh, um, advocating. And I want to stay where I lived and built and, and, and created um, in my district, in my neighborhood. I don't want to go to Queens. I don't want to go to Brooklyn. I want to stay where I'm at. I think the council should really consider having a housing committee member on a community board at the table with HPD when they pull these applications so that everyone can get a fair chance. Thank you. That's actually a pretty good recommendation. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, council members. Afternoon. My name is Lyric Thompson. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Well, you know, slightly pissed off. HPD is a red hot mess. Not only are, do I find it offensive that we have a lottery for affordable housing. You just might win affordable housing. Granted, it might not be anywhere where you wanna live or in the area of the city where you enjoy. 
just shut up and be glad that you have housing. Now, we're supposed to be happy for that, and, and I do support Salamanca's, uh, Council Member Salamanca's bill. I think it's, it, we have issues with homeless, as well as Council Member Levine's bill with regard to an oversight and task force for HPD. However, we're not addressing the fact that HPD is the root of our issues. HPD development, do they pay attention to the developers that are, uh, that are engaging in business with them? In our 421A building, they most certainly didn't. Not only did they not have the, the landlord fill out the required paperwork, but they accepted forged documents to fiend compliance with their 421A. And Molly Parks, the woman that was just here testifying, she knows. They've known for years. Hell, they know our building wasn't even finished, but crickets. I can't help but think <clears throat> that that's not in the best interest of our city. Then we have the repair problems, the revolving repairs. I mean, a, a year ago, actually in, in February, it's going to be our year anniversary. You all uh, passed legislation last year with regard to fire doors. We had that big fire in the Bronx. People died. So we, we came here. We put forth legislation and got it passed. Yet no one bothered to tell HPD. <laughs> We've had problems with our front door. We've had over 25 violations written on this door. Everything from replace the striker plate, which there's only half of a striker plate on the door, rehang the door, put a fire door, et cetera, et cetera. They've all been removed, revolving like, with uh, absolutely no standards. January 1st, it took me 45 minutes to open the door so a tenant could get out of the building. This is a door that HPD says is perfectly okay. Now, my council member has asked for an oversight hearing with regard to HPD standards. It's not just me that says we have a problem. I'm sure there's a lot of other people in this room that have a problem with HPD standards. But there was a New York Times article that came out on December 26 that pretty much sums up our problem with HPD. And it is this. It boils down to HPD not wanting to go after bad players. The city's housing department says its goal is to correct violations, not punish landlords. And they're doing neither. Accepting patch quick fixes? That is not a repair. That's not going to withstand the storms that are coming with climate change. Not punish landlords? I'm sorry. Give a mouse a cookie. They're going to require a glass of milk. When HPD does not enforce the fining structure that we have in place, when they take $4,000 in fines, when the, the accrued fines are actually $100,000, there's absolutely no reason for them to abide by the law. Why should they? It's cheaper for them not to. So I'm going to ask you, Council Member Corgney, an honorable chair, my Council Member Rafael Espinal has asked for an oversight hearing with regard to HPD standards of repair and what they accept as repair for over a year. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and hold that hearing because it is endangering the citizens in my city, HPD's pathetically low standards, and, and I'm done dealing with it. It's been three and a half years trying to get a door fixed. And more than that, I'd also ask this board to hold a hearing with regard to legislation that he, he would like to introduce that would actually deal with a lot of these issues that I'm dealing with and too many of my fellow citizens are dealing with. I'd be really happy about that, too. Thank you. We are actually um, reviewing, I'm just being told, um, uh, Espinal's request, and, and probably we will be having some hearing in regards to that. So thank you for your advocacy. I'd, well, you know, I mean, the thing is, is I'm trying to uh, deal with this problem. I think one of my biggest problems is why is HPD allowing developers to violate the laws? Why is HPD allowing a developer to submit forge documents to fiend compliance with the tax exemption. I mean, honestly, that just doesn't send out a good message. I can't help but think that maybe, just maybe, if we took some of these bad players and put their ass in jail like the law calls for, they might think twice before they, before they act out in such an emboldened, abusive way. And it's abusive to the citizens, the people that have to endure their, their ridiculousness, and it's also draining on our city resources. So. If we could do something about that, that would just be swell. Thank, thank you, Ms. Thompson. So unfortunately, we have a hearing that is waiting in the hallway right behind us. So I have to adjourn this hearing. Thank you so much. And we'll take questions outside if we have to. We'll have them? If you want to take any questions outside, please. Which one do you think is prepared? <laughs>